Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Good afternoon, everybody. It is the Steve Jones Show on a Tuesday. News Radio 1070 WKOK, two days away from Turkey Day. Matt Catrillo here with you in the producer chair. Steve will soon be there from the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. And online at sunburymotors.com. A lot going on in the NFL today. And a lot of, I would say, not so good news. Well, before we get to that, The good news first is we have 25 of our semifinalists for the Pro Football Hall of Fame class for 2021. And Peyton Manning, among them, a couple first ballot Hall of Famers, or first ballot uh, entries, I should say. He should be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, Jared Allen's in there, too. Megatron, Calvin Johnson from the Lions is in there. And uh, a whole bunch of others. So that's the good news that we've seen out of the NFL today. The bad news is the Ravens. It looks like they're up to 10 positive tests right now among players and staff, which is obviously not a good sign considering they have the quick turnaround for the Thanksgiving night game at Pittsburgh. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that as far as should the game be moved at all. But as of now, the NFL is saying they're monitoring the situation, and right now it is a go for Thursday night. And some big names on that list, as Steve and I talked about yesterday. Brandon Williams at nose tackle. That's going to be a big loss for the Ravens up front on defense. Marvin yeah. Ingram is also – or Mark Ingram, excuse me, is also I mean, on the COVID have, list too. So, yeah, the have big you watched, problems for have the you Ravens. Watched the, have you watched this team play lately? Yeah, I, I – hey. They, they, I, they, they can have everybody and not do well. That's true. Yeah, this is a huge <laughs> game for them to not only, of course, keep their slim chances for the – AFC North alive. Steelers essentially clinch it unofficially with a win, but you know that's a wild playoff picture right now in the AFC. Yeah, um, that's for example, the AFC is a standard to their credit. If you're above 500, you're in the race. Uh, so, um... <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that's exactly right. I have never seen a division like the NFC East. Ever. Me neither. Unfortunately, e- even that even that year where Seattle won the last game of the season over the Rams and got the seven and nine, and the Rams fell to six and ten. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if any of these teams in the East get the six wins. I don't know. I don't think so. Even though I will say, with all due credit and respect, they're all within two games of five wins. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> they're, exactly. they're all there. They're all there, buddy. Including your team. In fact, I'm wondering now if it's at the point where you're rooting for your team to not do well. But you know what that means? That means you would draft higher, and you don't like how they draft. So everything is wrong. But see, if they... You're you're mad you're mad at Howie Roseman, you're mad at Doug Peterson, you're mad at Carson Wentz, you're mad at Luke Catrillo, you're mad at I mean <laughs> I'm not necessarily mad with Carson. I'm more disappointed because not all of this is his fault. It's the well, people let, above him that have set him up to fail. Well As I said yesterday, I get... if it, I wonder how Carson would do with a change of coach. I think he might do better. I honestly do. Man, who might that coach be? You know what? I was actually thinking about that today, and 
I think the perfect coach, <laughs> perfect candidate for the Eagles right now would be Eric Bahimi, the offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. Eric Bieniemy. Yeah, yeah. Bieniemy. Excuse me. Yeah. No, oh, no, he's been high in everybody's list for a year. I was surprised he didn't get a job last year. Now I was too. He was talked about at one point about would the Jets go? I, I'll say this: I know there are only thirty-two of these jobs. I would not take the Jets job. Oh no way! To me, that is a recipe um, for disaster. And it, that's where. Let's give the Jets credit. It's where careers go to die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, James Franklin at his press conference today. Uh, so obviously we're we're I have no I get at, I'm on a lot of shows. In fact, I got to respond to another text about that. I'm on a lot of shows. Um, and of course, I get asked, you know, what do I think? And I and I tell everybody, I said, look, if I really knew, I'd tell them. I wouldn't be on the phone with you <laughs> if, if, if I knew. Uh, I mean, I see certain things like everybody else does, but I I just don't know. But I will say this, and I, I haven't really talked about this yet, but I, I'm I'm going to I might as well just talk about this part right now there will be people that you know and when you do a show like this people are going to disagree with you people are going to disagree with what i'm about to say some some will some won't but i want to talk about brent pry kirk shiraka james franklin all right brent pry i am very big very big on known entities People that have a track record where it's not a guess as to how well they might do, where it's a roll of the dice that, hey, I hope we hire the right guy. Brent Pry, and again, each one of these guys this season has probably made a, a couple calls here and there in each game where they sat back and go, ah, oh, I shouldn't have called that. that that's, you're not going to call a perfect game. And there's some calls that you've made that are absolutely terrific calls and somebody missed an assignment. Now, they would know that. You and I would not. But Brent Pry is a known entity to me. I know what he can do. Whether it's as a recruiter, as a teacher, or as a coordinator. Known entity to me. For example... I'll give you an example of a play uh, where Iowa scored a touchdown. So Iowa scores a touchdown um, on the Goodson run. Iowa tries to go flow one direction with the idea they're going get, to get the flow to work their way, and then they come back the other way with Goodson. Well, they run it, and Penn State is in perfect position. It was well-taught, well-coached. And Jesse Lucetta's out there one on one with him. And Lucetta flat out misses it. Well, is that the coordinator's fault? Is that the linebacking coaching fault? No, it's an execution fault. That's an example, right? Not going to go through all the other examples. Um, and uh, so, as a known entity, he would be the one I would trust to bring the defense back. This is moving forward from this season. Kirk Shiraka, they said in the offseason on the show several times, hey, look, I think he's a pro's pro. I don't think it's any coincidence that Tanner Morgan last year played really well for Minnesota, really well. And that Tanner Morgan this year without Kirk is not playing as well. And I say that with all due respect to the person that's coaching him now. And I don't know, I have not looked, I don't know who's who the – coordinator and quarterback coaches for Minnesota this season. They just don't know. But Tanner Morgan is not playing at the same level that he played last season for Kirk. I've followed Kirk for a long time. I think he's a pro's pro. If I had to pick anybody that could do it, something with 
the Penn State offense moving forward, it's going to be him. Because I, to me, he is a known entity, a known entity on the positive side, just like Brent Pry is a known entity on the positive side. Now let's get to James Franklin. James Franklin, and I've said it once, I've said it 50, 60 times on the show, Bill O'Brien told me over and over again that the worst two years of the sanctions would be 14 and 15. Over and over again, Bill told me that. Okay? Yeah, you know, one of those, hey, just trying to prepare me for what, you know, what was going to be tough times. I, I understood. Well, it turned out in those tough times, it was James Franklin that took over. James' first year, they had 63 scholarship players, 41 more available for the pinstripe bowl, and they still won the darn thing. So he navigates 14 and 15 and then puts this program on a four-year run of 42 wins, three New Year's New Year's Six Bowl appearances, a Big Ten championship, and two New Year's Six wins. So I want to go with a known entity that has shown me they can take something that's tough and build it into something moving forward. He's already proven that to me. I would hope he's proven that to you. Now, you may not agree with any of this, but I, I'm always big on known entities, people with track records. And I think the three of them have track records that maybe some of you don't trust, your fans, and I understand that. Right? But they are track records I trust. Since my name's on the show, I get to say it. <laughs> you can call in and tell me I'm I'm uh, full of beans, but uh, you know I follow this very closely across the board, uh, and I am very big on track records of known entities in the positive direction. All three of them have that. And again, if you're going to say, okay, they need to get the program back on track. I want somebody that put the program back on track to begin with. James Franklin. He's done that. And hopefully it can happen in a more normal year. And, you know, I discounted spring practice somewhat because, yeah, you didn't have spring practice. Some teams did, though. You know, Clemson had spring practice. Alabama did. Indiana did and Ohio State had started and was already into spring practice. I mean, that already had happened. But under the circumstances with Penn State, you know, you're doing walkthroughs. Well, in walkthroughs, you don't hit. I'm talking about like trench warfare now, offensive and defensive lines. Walkthroughs, you don't hit. Then they got four preseason practices in in August. But again, those were the quote acclimation practices. So guess what you're not doing? You're not hitting. Then they did skill instruction. Well, guess what's not happening in skill instruction? Then finally you get to the preseason, you have a preseason. And I think the lack of a spring practice where you're out there, out of 15 practices, you're hitting 11 of them because you're really trying to find out who can and can't, especially and with new coaches and John Scott and Phil Troutwine, I think that set them back in terms of what they wanted to do because – those 11 practices where there's not the pressure of a game, you're not trying to prepare to get ready for a game, you're just trying to find out, okay, now in practical application, let's see what I have here. and see how I can teach. And I discounted that. And you know what? The more I thought about it is that with the, with the new coaches, especially with Phil and with John, they didn't really get the benefit of that, okay, let's go hit, let's see what you got here. So now in the in the proceeding in the in the months following, I can sit back and say pro or con, hey look, we gotta work on this, we gotta work on that, you gotta work on this, you gotta work on that. I like where you're going there. And they didn't have that because walkthroughs, acclimations, skill instructions, when it comes to the trench part of it, I mean the other parts benefit, you know, in walkthroughs and things that you benefit through that, the depth of a the depth of a route and things like that. Yeah, you can benefit from that. But the trench part, I'm not so sure you you, you benefit that much from that. It's where losing spring practice, I think, in the end, did not help in any way, shape, or form. There are other issues, but the biggest one, of course, is the, the turnover thing. 
I mean, at the top of the pyramid, that's where the dominoes fall all over the place. Everywhere you turn, everything gets affected from your field position, back against the wall, killing a drive, momentum, right? Now it starts, you know, now you fall behind because the turnover is happening in an opportune time. It, you know, it, it leads to all the problems the fans have talked about. The top of the pyramid is that, which then dominoes into the issues the fans have, have talked about and have had, you know, and justifiably have had questions about. All right. We'll take a break. Back with more in a moment. Great to have you with us today here on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Sunbury Motors. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applications applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way? The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. All right. Welcome. Great to have you with us. The uh, Penn State basketball game with Drexel uh, has been canceled for tomorrow. Why, we don't know. It, 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 based on the fact that they're still saying Penn State's going to play VMI on Saturday. That that game is still on, it, it probably indicates that it's a Drexel problem. Um, so the game with VMI on Saturday remains on the schedule at 5 o'clock. But the um, Penn State basketball game with Drexel tomorrow, uh, and, and, and the guy in the back, can you hear the hooping and hollering in the background? That's the uh, suit who absolutely did not want that game tomorrow at 1 o'clock because I I don't know. He's not, he's, he's not a fun guy, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, they have not said, by the way, they've said canceled, but you know what? It says here that the Drexel game on Wednesday has been postponed. Okay? That's different than canceled. Canceled means it's never happening. All right? Postponed means they can push it back to a different time. All right? So we'll see. VMI is still on. Drexel is in postponement. Uh, when do you postpone it to? I don't know. I mean, maybe you could do it during, obviously, the Christmas break. Taking your calls at 800 795 9565. This is The Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now, from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. All right. Uh, Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia, Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf, and online at sunburymotors.com. Ford, Lincoln, Kia, Hyundai, great new inventory. Great time of the year to buy, two great deals. Awesome pre-owned inventory and a fabulous service department to go with it. All at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf and online at sunburymotors.com. So uh, the Penn State men's basketball season opener against Drexel tomorrow has been postponed due to COVID-19 protocols. They are discussing the possibility of rescheduling. That's why the word postponed is there and not canceled. And we'll see how that plays out. 
As uh, Dick Girardi and I have said to each other many times, the goal is to play a game. And then the second goal is to play a second game. And then the third goal is to play a third game. The game with VMI right now is still on for Saturday at the Jordan Center. All right. All right, Jeff, let's uh, talk about uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Longtime Eagles reporter. It's going to be a lot of fun. My co-host is, you know, I mean, I feel like I feel like he's laying on a couch and it's a therapy session. So it's going to be up to you to help me out here. <laughs> Who's my therapist? Uh, I, again, I'm going to have to sit in this chair and I'll have to accept whatever is said <laughs> and go from there. <laughs> Steve, it's uh, it's been a long time, man. It's good to catch up with you. Thanks for having me on. It's too long. It's Definitely. too long. All I hope right. you're well. So let, I am doing very well. And by the way, thank you for the very kind words. He sent a private message, which I appreciated very much. Uh, okay, when you look at this team, okay, I'll, I'll do the Apollo 13. What's good on the spacecraft? <laughs> yeah. Um, man, it's uh, so... So as you know, Steve, you know you watch enough football in your life to know that when things are going wrong, uh, it's never one thing. I mean, the head coach gets blamed, the quarterback gets blamed, the barking dog in the background that you might hear is going to get some blame after this phone call. But um, there, there, there's so many things. <laughs> there's so many things that you know. I, I watched the tape of the game, the, the Browns game today. Uh, I specifically focused in on third down because the Eagles have been. That's really the root of their problems for the past two weeks, at least, the inability to move the chains on the third and medium, third and long. And, uh, you know, if I think there were two of ten, and I went through them. You know, there was probably four plays in particular where the, the protection was just so bad that Carson Wentz did not have a chance to make a throw. There were four plays where Carson hesitated too long where the throw was there. And then there were a couple of plays where there were just – good coverage and maybe you think that maybe a better route design and route concept would have helped so you you, you take the piece of the pie you cut it up and you give a big piece to a lot of different people there and that's that's what leads to uh, an offense that is basically been dysfunctional for all, all year long i mean they have so many issues going on and they're all interchangeable and they're all woven into you know you can talk about carson his, his all of a sudden his regression being related to all the hits that he's taken. You can talk about him holding on to the ball as a reason he's taking the hits, and you can talk about mm-hmm. play calling as a, a predictability there and, and defenses knowing when to rush and what to do and how to cover. When do you think his issues with some indecision began? Where you saw some signs of you know, he's not quite the same decisive guy as two years ago. When did you start to see the signs of that? You know, there were decision making is different than mechanics. From, from a mechanical standpoint, there were always times during Carson Wentz's career where he didn't have the best mechanics, but he had such tremendous athleticism that he could buy time in the pocket and he could do things that a lot of other quarterbacks couldn't do. But he's taken a lot of hits and some injuries, and so mechanics element starts to creep up on him. And when your mechanics aren't great um, and you're not trusting what you see on the field, which I think that has really started going back to last year a little bit when uh, he had a lot of injuries to wide receivers, Alshon Jeff injured, and they were pretty much pulling guys off the street and asking Carson to win with these street free agents. Um, I think that that's where it started last year. But in December of last year, he was able to just say, hey, I got to trust these guys. Let me rip it. And he was able to rip it, and they went undefeated in the month of December, and they won the uh, – the division again but this year even they've had so many different offensive linemen in and out and a lot of different weapons around him in and out that I think that's where the trust issues have restarted and then that combined with the protection issues and some of the other things that have set the offense back have all kind of mixed into the cauldron here and added to his regression but you know I think some of that can be overcome if you're more technically sound with your mechanics or you're uh, pre-snap reads of the defense are really on key, but he's always kind of been a guy who's, you know, that first receiver isn't there, then he try to get to the second one. If not, he can run and get out of it, but he doesn't do that as much anymore, and um, so all that has kind of contributed to a guy who's kind of, I think he's looking for answers, and then a lot of it is in his head because the answers aren't coming as easily as they used to. 
You mentioned about the running part of it. When you hurt your knee, you might be a little more shy about running. Do you think that's possible it enters into his head? Yeah, I mean, he, it was not just the knee, right? He came back from the knee, and then the following yeah. year, he wound up having a, a fracture in his lower back that they discovered exactly. halfway through through the year. And then, of course, you know, last year in the playoff game, he got hit, you know, late, hard by Jadavian Clowney in the back of the head, and that caused him to go crashing into the turf, and he wound up missing the only playoff game he's ever played in after about 10 snaps. So I think in general, that and the hit toll that he's collected – this year has just taken away some of what you used to see from him early in his career, which is an electrifying runner, a very good open field runner. I mean, there's there's times where he doesn't have an opportunity to tuck right. run now because he's getting getting swarmed. But I certainly think that when you watch him run, it's not as dynamic and explosive as it was in say 2016 and 17. All right. Uh, so, uh, but it's not just him. Uh, you need help along the way. How yep. hurt has he been by an offensive line that is nowhere near what they thought they were going to have in August? Very much so, Steve. I mean, I really think that you know, if he had had if he had an offensive line that was at least reliable uh, from a health standpoint, he would be able to at least understand certain guys what their tendencies are, where their weaknesses are. But they have a carousel at almost every single position. A left tackle has really hurt them with Jason Peters. You know, he's a guy that I felt that they probably shouldn't have brought back um, because of the age and the decline. Eventually, it's going to catch up to you to the point where you're not even that guy, even close to what they thought you were. And he had some decent games when he came back from an injury, uh, which, again, caused the shuffle, being him being hurt. Uh, he had some decent games against Dallas and the Giants. But th- this game against Cleveland, with no Miles Garrett, where he's matched up against Olivier Vernon and Adrian Claiborne, guys who have been in the league for quite a while but aren't, you know, what they used to be either. I mean, he was owned by them, and that was very surprising. Uh, and that really contributed to a lot of what was going on with the offense, along with, you know, at right guard, they haven't had Brandon Brooks, who's been out all year. He's a, he's a, he's a pro bowler. Uh, right tackle, Lane Johnson, has been dealing with an ankle injury and a knee injury all year. He was in and out. I think they played seven different offensive linemen alone in that game against the Browns, and that was their ninth different combination in 10 or 11, 10 games at that point. So, you know, anyone who knows football knows it all starts up front, and when you've got yeah. a, road, uh, a carousel like that, it's never good for the quarterback. Jeff, I know obviously Baker Mayfield did not turn in what you would call a stellar performance. I thought his I thought his progressive commercials were better than his on-field performance <laughs> on Sunday. But did the Eagles in some ways play better defensively? Well, they did, but they also I don't, look, I don't want to take credit away from the Eagles. They definitely did an excellent job for three quarters stopping the run. And they were on the field too much because of the offense yeah. turning the ball over. And but but they also Steve, you know, they played at times three or four linebackers. If they weren't gonna play three linebackers, you know, if they were a nickel, they were still gonna bring a safety into the box. I'm I'm not discrediting their their accomplishment at all but they certainly sold out against the run and they left some opportunities there for baker and he hit about two or three plays of of 20 30 yards he also missed a couple of easy ones as as you're referring to he didn't play great but he played within himself and he didn't make any and this is a guy who had 21 interceptions last year so i think their coaching staff their new staff has done a really good job of you know, I don't want to call it hide the quarterback, but I think that they all sure. they all know there in Cleveland that they got a they got a crawl before they walk, and they had no real option to get with him. So they're just doing what they do best, and they've got two unbelievable running backs and a really good offensive line, and that's that's how they're going to try to win games. Right, exactly along the way, and but the division is. Have you ever seen a division like this? I know the NFC West had that year where. At six and nine, Seattle played mm-hmm. the Rams. Seattle won. They ended up seven and nine. Rams six and ten. Seattle got in, then beat the Saints in a in a home game when fans were allowed to be there in mass. But have you ever seen the division like this? No, no, never, never in my life. I think that what you the the year you're referring to with the NFC West was interesting. And same thing, there was a year where the Panthers. With Rivera and Newton, I think in second or third year of Cam's career, mm-hmm. made it in, uh, won the division with a sub 500 record. But the least you could say that the 
punk and we're not even in it. But here is a case where all four teams really do stink and all four teams are taking turns being in first place. And all four teams right now are telling themselves a chance to win the division no matter how bad it looks, which is which is shocking. I mean, Doug Peterson, who's just lost two straight games, lost five of the last seven, his team is 3-6-1, and one, is sitting in a press conference saying his team is in a great spot. I mean, how laughable is that? But it's true. They're in a great spot because by virtue of a tie, they lead the NFC East over everybody else. It's unbelievable. A tie was with Cincinnati, which had mm-hmm. drew, drew, and was looked at as a disaster at the time. And I remember saying on the show, I said, believe it or not, that could determine the division. It could. It did in 2008. They actually tied Cincinnati that year as well. Yes. There. That was the one where Donovan <laughs> McNabb wasn't sure of the overtime rules. But I remember. That's correct. Yes, you are right. They tied, and then um, they they were a bad team for most of that year, and then really caught, like many Andy Reid teams of the late 2000s when he coached the Eagles, they caught fire after Thanksgiving. Uh, they needed two other teams to win that. On, on the final game of the year, they needed two teams to win, including the Raiders. That's how you know you're, you really need something. You needed the Raiders to win the game. They did, and then they had to go out and beat the Cowboys, which they, I think they, they won 44-6 to six that game and yeah. made it into the playoffs as a division winner thanks to that tie that didn't count as a loss. It's unbelievable. <laughs> this whole thing is unbelievable. I feel like you're sitting there and you're looking around saying, really? I mean, you have four teams in the division with three wins. Uh I, <laughs> it's, it's unreal. Now they get Seattle. Three, and not only that, Steve, but like you're talking about four teams that in the history of this sport are considered, you know, the, the NFC East is what it is because you have four of the biggest market teams in the NFL and the deepest yeah. pocketed owners. And but my God, yeah. these guys can't get it right at all. I mean, they're just really sad. <laughs> I mean, none of them have practiced taking a knee because they lose. All right, so <laughs> uh, now they got Russell Wilson in Seattle. Now Seattle's defense not that good, but Russell Wilson makes up for a lot of sins. What, what's your thoughts on the Monday night matchup? So Russell Wilson is five and zero in his career against the Eagles. Yep. So it's been quite a long time since the Eagles have beaten Seattle. Um, and what the Eagles have really struggled with this year specifically on defense is the zone read. Uh, I think everybody remembers the Daniel Jones 80-yard, uh, I can't call it a touchdown because the turf monster got him there at the 20, but uh, the 80-yard two weeks later whoops. he came back. Yeah, <laughs> the 80-yard yeah. whoops. And then, two, then two weeks later he had the 35-yard touchdown on yeah. zone read, and then Lamar Jackson got him on zone read for a 37-yard touchdown. Uh, if you go back last year, Josh Allen got him on zone read, so it, for whatever reason this team has been very undisciplined you know, Russell Wilson is a zone read master. He already has uh, two zone read plays this year where he kept the ball and got uh, 27 yards on one or 34 on another. So, you know, if you're if you're out there in Vegas and you're <laughs> you're handicapping this game, you yeah. you got to think Russell Wilson's good for a couple of long runs against this Eagles defense. And given his record against the Eagles, you got to yeah, you're either a believer in the law of averages that the Eagles are going to finally win one, or you're a believer yeah. in history and precedent and think that this is Seattle's game to take. I mean, then they got Aaron Rodgers and the Packers at Lambeau. Then they got Taysom Hill and the Saints. And then they got Kyler Murray and the Cardinals. Then finally they got the Cowboys in Washington and back-to-back to finish. I mean, if you're an Eagles fan, I don't think you see a lot of wins here. I mean, you could realistically you probably – it doesn't sound crazy right now and wonder if they're going to win a game at all the rest of the year the way they're playing. Now, last year, Steve, they were – they had lost three in a row. They lost to Seattle. They lost to New England. And then they capped it off with a loss to Miami. And everybody was, yeah. at that point, completely off the, the bandwagon. But the one saving grace is they they were getting a little healthier. And then in December, they had games against the Giants, one game against Washington, one game against Dallas. So they had the whole division, and none of those teams were very good. So all they had to do was kind of show up and then beat Dallas in the one important game, which they did. This year, it's a completely different story. You're, you're two games – sort of under 500 and you've got four you've got the toughest part of your schedule coming up four teams that although they're not all perfect they all do one thing well and that's score a lot of points and the eagles right now aren't scoring points at all so 
to, to think that they're going to snap their fingers and be able to score the 28 to 31 points that you need usually to beat New Orleans and Arizona and Seattle and, and Green Bay is a really tough pill to swallow. I, it's hard to see that happening. Well, Jeff, uh, to you and yours, have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, we really appreciate the time you gave us today. It's been too long. It has been. Let's not make it too much longer. It's been great. It's been fun. Um, and I, I miss you guys up there, man. It's, uh, it's been too long since I've been back. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it has been way too long. Thank you so much. Have a great Thanksgiving, okay, bud? You got it, friend. Take care. Yeah, you bet. Jeff's terrific. Um I heard in the background the suit. Yes, working uh, his magic. Getting uh, no, what he's getting ready for. Tell everybody again, he's getting ready for what? For a talk to Santa. We were just getting some right. technical things okay. ready behind mm-hmm. the scenes here. No offense, isn't he too big for that? <laughs> we'll come back with more in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK. All right, uh, Dave Pash is going to join us in the uh, final half hour of the show. We're going to get Neil Kulong on today as well. Talking about the uh, Steelers. Because I wanted to get the show to a positive level. Uh, and hey, I don't blame you, especially for our Steelers part of our audience. Uh, once again, uh, just so you know, yeah, just so you know, the Penn State basketball game with Drexel tomorrow postponed. Uh, after that, I, I don't have any other details as to why. And, and when I mean that, does it mean there was a positive test on Penn State? Was there a positive test on Drexel? I mean, I, again, don't know. Okay, don't know. Uh, but the fact that they've also said that the game with VMI for Saturday is still on, you, know, you feel like in some ways that's revealing. So, but don't want to guess. Suit was happy. It's all that really matters. Yes, his happiness is all that matters in our world. Well, no, what bothers me is that instead of going out and selling something, he's been sitting in front of the magic radio all day making requests. <laughs> I, I, it's just not, Typical. It's not. It's scary. Grown man. I mean, it's, that's for you. you know, I thought this was supposed to be for kids. The man loves the holiday season. What can I say? I understand that, but I thought this was for kids. I supposed to, you know, I, I read the rules. I, Ages four to eight. I mean, I, I, he's like George Costanza at the birthday party. Well, when, a, when, a, when the fire breaks out, he throws all the kids out of the way and gets out of the house. And that's he'll be guy. here night one. I mean, I mean, that's our guy. It's the way it is. It scares the heck out of me. Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> all right. Well, as Dick and I both said, the goal is to play a game. The second goal is to play a second game. Jim Ferry, by the way, will be on with us tonight on the Coaches Show. Remember, the Coaches Show is tonight because of Thanksgiving. We always do it on Tuesday. So Jim Ferry will be on in the opening half hour tonight. James Franklin's second half hour. So I'm not even close to being done for the day. As somebody sits in front of the magic radio. I want a million dollars. Please. Santa. Santa. Give me a money tree. <laughs>